Okay, everybody. My name is Fred Niehaus. I'm a technical marketing engineer here out of the Richfield, Ohio office. And I've been with Cisco since around 2000 or so. And this uh, presentation that we're going to do here is on understanding RF fundamentals and the design of wireless networks. So the goal, the goal here is to give you a good idea of what radio is, how did we get here, basic 802.11, hardware terminology, uh, antenna basics, understanding things like single, diver single antennas versus diversity antennas, as well as interpreting antenna patterns. I've deleted the, the Cisco Richfield facility uh, tour slides because I didn't want this thing to go off too long, but we'll, we'll cover diversity, multi-path, and choosing the right access point. So what exactly is radio? Well, if, if to understand what radio is, you really kind of need to understand a little bit about electricity. So there, there's two types of electricity out there. There's AC and DC, and then the rock group AC, DC, right? So, so DC is direct current, and that means that electricity flows from negative to positive in one direction only. That's why it's called direct current. Alternating current moves back and forth. And if you look at the uh, wall transformer up here, you know that that's typically what you see is, is is AC electricity is about to enter your home. And if you, if you had an oscilloscope or had a way to, to look at that AC, you would see this sine wave. And the sine wave shows that the electricity actually goes back and forth, right? So, so it peaks up in one direction, goes down below that line to a different direction, back up again, and so on and so forth. How fast that goes uh, is, is how many cycles per second it is. And if we go back to the old... Um, you know, the, the old days of, of early radio and things, the, the cycles per second was used be, to, to measure how fast that electricity went back and forth. And in AC, it's 60 cycles per second or 60 hertz now. So old radio used to be cycles per second, now it's called hertz. But the, the takeaway here is if you can go back and forth fast enough beyond what we do in AC, which is 60 cycles per second, that electricity will move back and forth so fast that it actually leaves the wire, and that's that's what radio is, right? And if you look at the popular radio frequencies below, you know, uh, you know, 100, you know, AM radio, like 1100 AM radio is 1.1 megahertz or 1100 kilohertz. And remember, AC is way down in 60 hertz. It's almost in the audible range. In fact, if you listen to um, fluorescent lights, you can actually hear that kind of a, a hum. But anyway, that what, what I wanted you to understand here is that Radio waves basically are a specific size. The lower the frequency, the longer the waves are. The higher the frequency, the shorter the waves are. And radio waves are measured in kilohertz, megahertz, and gigahertz. And it's just how many cycles in a second that it does is, is all that really means. So as I mentioned, as the frequency gets higher, the radiating element or the radio wave gets smaller. So if you take a look at these two dipoles on the left, you'll see the 2.4 gig dipole on the left has a higher or a longer radiating element than the 5 gig one. The 5 gig has a shorter radiating element. So it, 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 the higher the frequency, the smaller the radio wave. And there are different types of antennas out there. An omnidirectional antenna radiates much like a raw light bulb. It radiates, if you could kind of visual in a 3D beach ball effect, you know, you, you're radiating everywhere and all over the place. If you had a patch or a directional antenna, such as a Yagi or a patch antenna, it's the same as putting a piece of tinfoil behind the light bulb, and now you're radiating forward, right? So directional antennas go in a specific direction. You don't get any extra power. What happens there is, is we're just focusing and, and into a given direction. So keep in mind that antennas are custom made for the frequency they're to be used on. And some antennas have multiple elements in there if they're dual band antennas and things. And we'll touch on that in just a bit. So we start off with the radio wave leaves the wire. How it leaves can be molded by certain antennas. Then once you do that, then it's how do you get data on that, right? So kind of like the old modems where you had, you know, 300 baud and then, you know, 5,600 baud. You, know, you get faster throughput by using complex modulation schemes. So this is just kind of a chart of different... Um, you know, modulation coding schemes, if you look at the top left there, for dot .11n. I just kind of wanted to show you how that works. So if you have one transmitter on the air, dot .11n allows for multiple transmitters. But if you only had one transmitter on the air, 
sending one spatial stream, your MCX index would be 0 through 7, and then your modulation scheme would change. You, know, you can see that there's different types of modulation. Some of it you know, goes all the way back to the old .11b rates and things. But, but using complex modulation and using either one transmitter or two or multiple transmitters, you're able to get faster throughput. So now we've covered how we get modulation on, on the radio wave. We've covered what a radio wave is. Now, how do we end up on the frequencies we're on? Well, uh, you, I don't expect you to be able to read this, but this is a basically a chart of the radio spectrum in the U.S. So anything that can be um, measured or tracked and taxed on the federal government's involved, right? So, so if you look here, the source is the U.S. Department of Commerce. This is the entire radio spectrum in the United States and how it's mapped out. So, so I, it's unreadable, but let's look at the Wi-Fi part of it, right? So... Wi-Fi is unlicensed, which means it doesn't really show up as a, as a service. You know, it's not owned by the military or any, anybody. But you'll see in the, in the area there that part of it's in, in the amateur band, ham radio band. The folks in ham radio had 2.4 licensed to them, and 5 gig portions were licensed to them, as well as radio. You know, you'll see this marine radio navigation and radio location. A lot of these things in the 5 gig range, that's all weather satellites and, and, and weather radar, basically, is, is what's there. So why did the FCC give us these frequencies uh, instead of other frequencies? Well, uh, just a, a quick takeaway here. When the FCC gave away frequencies for free years and years ago, they actually used 27 megahertz, which was a CB band, and folks used illegal amplifiers and talked all over the world. And the FCC didn't really want that to happen on these frequencies. They wanted, to, they wanted us to use such a high frequency that we wouldn't go very far. And uh, 2.4 gigahertz actually um, is, is the same frequency in some cases as you may have heard as microwave ovens. And the reason for that is is because water actually oscillates or moves back and forth when bombarded with 2.4 gig. That's why when you put a wet paper towel in a microwave, it gets hot, and you put a dry one, and nothing happens. So the FCC figured if they give us these really high frequencies, we won't be able to do much with them, won't be able to go very far with them, and uh, kind of showed, showed them the, that you can do a lot with it. In fact, it's quite amazing the things that we've been able to do with the frequencies that we've been given. But Anyway, the takeaway is you have 5 gig and you have 2.4 gig. They're both unlicensed. Uh, they have their, their beginnings in the ISM or Industrial Scientific Medical Band. And if we look at devices that are out there today, even now with all the proliferation of .11n and, and 5 gig, there's still a lot of devices out there that just use only one band, and they use 2.4 gig. And the reason for that is, is a lot of times they'll take the same radio, like in this Dell or, or an iPhone, and they might leverage the same antenna for Bluetooth because Bluetooth is very uh, in the 2.4 gig range. So they'll, they'll use a Bluetooth and Wi-Fi all on one antenna, and they'll not do a 5 gig radio just for battery life. You know, they, they want this device to not suck a lot of battery power, so they'll, they'll do it on 2.4 only. So there's a lot of devices out there today that are still 2.4, but, but be aware that that there's 2.4 gig devices, there's 802.11a, which is 5 gig devices, and then 802.11n can be either band, 2.4 or 5 gig, and there's properties on .11n that we'll uh, touch on later. If you take a look at this next uh, slide, we're going to talk just a little bit about uh, terminology. I, there's no point in me reading this entire thing, but just kind of understand these are some common RF terms that you may see, so I've just kind of stuck that in there for your reference. Identifying RF connectors, all of these different products ha seem to have different kinds of radio connectors on them. So I wanted to take a picture of a lot of the most popular ones and kind of explain where they're coming from here. So when, when I talked earlier and said that on the 5 gigahertz and 2.4 gig bands, they were g given up to us because they, they're not conducive to you know, illegal amplifiers and things like that. Well, there's still amplifiers that you can get on these kind of bands. And for that reason, the FCC required that we use a unique or proprietary connector if the AP is going to be used in a non-professional installation uh, condition. So, so we like to sell to just about anybody 
our products, and we want to be able to have the guy that works in that school system with the big ball of keys on his belt to be able to put this in and not have, a, have to have an RF background to put them in. But the, the takeaway is, is RP is reverse polarity, TNC, threaded Neil complement connector. This is a connector, the TNC connector came out in the early 50s and 60s. And this RP is just a matter of changing the polarity, putting, if you look at the top left uh, picture, you'll see a, a, a jack here that actually has a, a female receptacle, and then the one on the right has a male pin in the middle of it. So they're really not male or female connectors. They're plug and jack because the, the polarity has been in, inverted. We, we, that pin is usually in a connector on the, on the left, you know, when it's just a TNC connector. So the takeaway is it's plug and jack and not really male-female. So the antenna connector that's on the AP is the one that's circled in blue. That, that's the jack and the antenna or the RF connector is the plug that goes on. So we use these RPTNCs on most of our equipment. Uh, Linksys and a few other people are some of our competitors use the um, RPSMA connector, which is just a, a little bit smaller connector. It's not as robust, in my opinion, for heavier cables and things, but, uh, you know, it, it works out okay. There's then, then the end connector down below is used on the mesh products. You'll see a lot of our 1500s, 1520s, 1550s. They use the end connector because it's a little bit more robust. If you look at the end connector at the bottom inside, you can actually see a rubber gasket material. It's kind of a, almost a weatherproof connector in its own right. So, you know, the end connector is a really good connector, but it requires a professional installer or the person to have some background in RF before they use an end connector. There's different kinds of cable that you can use. Most of our outdoor cable is the LMR 400, which is a foil and a shield up here at the top uh, left you'll see that that cable actually is copper, but I cut it, and you can see it's not copper in the center. And the reason for that is is because RF actually rides on the skin of the, uh, or the outside of the cable. So when you send a radio or an RF signal, it rides on the outside, and that's called skin effect. And since there's no benefit to having copper in the center conductor, sometimes these cables aren't copper, you know, in the, in the center. If you are a commercial TV radio station and you've got lots and lots of watts, then you use like an LMR 1200, and again, that's hollow in the center, copper all the way around, because it runs on the outside of the cable. LMR 1200 you won't see in Wi-Fi use. You may see this leaky coax or hard line, this heliax cable, because uh, with, with the heliax cable, you know, if, if you see DAS installations where they where they're putting antennas all throughout the building and running one antenna all the way through it, they'll use this cable because it's uh, it's got a lot less loss in it. You know, it's it's actually solid copper, and uh, it's kind of got these these you know bubbles or whatever you want to call them, you know, ridges in there so that you can bend the cable. But but that's the difference uh, in cables. We in 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 our environment, you're going to see LMR 400 and LMR 600 used primarily. But if you want to see what they look like, you know, you'll see that the smaller cable, like the LMR 200, which is like 3 16th cable. You'll see we'll use that kind of cable, and it's sometimes called RG58 for physical size-wise, on the antennas, because the antennas inside only have about three feet of cable, so we'll use the skinnier cable because it's easier to route it with. But that's just a breakdown of all the different kinds. The LMR 400 and LMR 600, which is three-eighths and half-inch cable, is the most popular for Wi-Fi use. When you, LMR, by the way, stands for Land Mobile Radio. It's just, uh, you know, that that's you see LMR, it's just land mobile radio, because the cable found its way first in those industries, you know, police and fire radio, things like that. It's a Times Microwave product. Um, that Times Microwave makes LMR 400 to 600. There's also a lot of different companies, Belden and other people, that make similar cables as well. But this is your loss in dB. And you'll notice that, as I mentioned before, the lower the frequency, the bigger the radio wave, so therefore the less loss. So at 30 megahertz, you know, you've only got 0.7 dB in a 100-foot of cable. But you start getting up to 2.4 gig, you know, and you start getting around 6.7 dB or so of loss per 100-foot of cable. If you do a larger cable, you know, like the LMR 600, now when you go up to 2.4, your loss is now, you know, right around you know, 4.3, you know, 4.1 or so per 100 feet. So if you've got to run a long cable, you know, keep in mind you, you, you lose a lot of performance on that because you, you 
you're losing dB every time you extend that cable out. So the best antenna is one that's right next to the AP or very next to the radio. You always want to try to keep your cable lengths down as low as you can. If you ever see orange cable, it means it's plenum rated. Usually, uh, a lot of times, if, if the cable is plenum, and what, and what plenum means is, is smoke. If you if you're running cable above a ceiling in a in a drop ceiling environment, and there's a fire, they don't want that cable just burning black smoke and you know causing problems in in a, in a fire for firemen and other people, right? So so the cable needs to be plenum. Now our cables, LMR 400 and 600, are not plenum rated because they're designed for outdoor use. But you can get plenum cable from Times Microwave in orange or black if you need to run a, a plenum cable indoors. Now, all the antennas that we have have a three-foot cable, just a small cable that's white, and those are plenum rated. So we, all of our antennas for indoors have plenum rated cable. But if you're going to use extend that antenna out farther, don't use our outdoor cable to do it. It's not plenum. Let's talk a little bit about antennas for a moment. So an antenna is a device that radiates and you know or transmits radio signals and receives radio signals. As I mentioned before, they're usually designed to operate at a specific frequency. Wideband antennas can do multiple frequencies, but it's usually a trade-off. A lot of times in DAS environments, you'll see they'll have a conical antenna that's up on the wall that handle cellular and Wi-Fi and everything all at once. And those antennas are okay, but they don't perform as well as an antenna that's cut to the frequency that you're going to use. So when you make an antenna, you measure its gain. And there's two types of gain. There's DBD and DBI. And DBD is gain of a decibel over a dipole, which we saw a dipole earlier. That's the, the antenna that has a single element and a, and a counterpoise behind it, you know, or, you know, like a little bell behind it. And then there's DBI. DBI is an isotropic antenna, which is a computer model dipole. DBI is an easier gain number to use when you're trying to do mathematics and figuring out EIRP and other things. DBD, decibel over dipole, is the standard by which antennas were measured years ago. So when we were Aeronet and first started making antennas back in, I don't know, 93, 95, something like that. When we were doing that, our antennas had DVD ratings, gain decibel over a dipole. So we would sell a 3 dBi dipole antenna, and the package would say, you know, Aeronet, and for a while it said Cisco 3 DVD. You know. And um, because DBI is a computer model antenna gain, and it's a higher number, you just simply add, you know, 2.14 to a 3 dBd antenna, and you end up with 5.1 four, which folks rounded up to, to, to uh, 5.2. caused us a lot of pain for a while because we were selling 3 dBd antennas and all of our competitors were selling 5.2 dBi. Well, what do you want, a 5.2 or a 3? So, you know, marketing-wise, uh, the dBi won out is, is the takeaway here. So when you look at a dipole, the radiating element is exactly the size of the radio wave that we're sending out, or it's a multiple. It could be a quarter of the wave, half of a wave. But if you don't have it cut to the exact frequency, then it's not efficient. The, the radio signal doesn't completely go out the antenna. Some of it comes back down the cable from a mismatch. And sometimes you'll hear that as called, you know, VSWR or the SWR, or the antenna match, you know. And, and you don't have to match Cisco antennas because all of our antennas are pre-cut to the frequencies that we're using and they're optimized to, to work. And when you look at this, the bell behind that element is the same size as the actual radiating element. And if you remember the older cars, the windshields would do that. The wire would come up, and it would go out to the left and go out to the right, and you'd have a horizontal dipole, kind of like the picture below at the bottom. Well, horizontal fields are used outdoors sometimes in the old TV things because you know, I, I, there was less man-made noise in a horizontal polarity outdoors for links. So you'll see some people might do bridge links with dishes or something and set them at horizontal polarity. But, but most of all of our antennas, most of our things are vertical polarity. The antenna is up in the air and, and radiating straight up. And if you look at the pattern here at the, at the right, you can see it's a, it's a concentric, nice, uniform circle. Nothing radiates better than a, a low-gain dipole. It radiates just like a beach ball. You know, when you 
when you start integrating the antenna into the AP like we do in our internal units and things, they work well, but there's some trade-offs and things we have to do. I mean, again, when you have an antenna that's away from the electronics of the device, it's in free space, it really radiates well. So a dipole has two elements, a radiating element and a counterpoise or ground element, which is that metal that you see on the bell of that. There are antennas called monopoles, and a monopole is an antenna where you got rid of the ground or that bell that you saw, and you're using the ground of something else. So in the case of the internal APs, we use the metal chassis of the AP as the ground, and we have the center conductor, the radiating element, the monopole, if you will, on top of the AP. And it radiates pretty good, but, but nothing is as ideal as a perfect dipole in free space. So the uh, takeaway is these monopoles have been around for a long time. Uh, the picture on the right there is actually uh, a radio station that this antenna is a Blonox antenna, and it was erected in 1932. And it's actually a, mo it's a monopole for an AM broadcast station, and it uses the earth ground as that ground. Instead of using the metal of the AP, it uses the actual earth ground to do that. And when they did that, because of differences in the earth ground and, and, and frequency and all, even that monopole had a problem. When they first built that thing, it was like 828 or 38 feet, and they had a null spot over Knoxville. You could hear that antennas in, this, that antennas in Nashville, Tennessee, broadcast Grand Ole Opry things, and they couldn't cover Knoxville. Now, they could be heard in half of Canada and about, you know, I think it's 48, 43 states or so in half of Canada, but they couldn't cover Knoxville until they dropped about, you know, 20 or 30 feet off the top of that tower and turned into a flagpole somewhere. So even, um, you know, even the, the biggest things you design, you know, you can find things that real life affects it, right? So when you mount an AP, that's the whole purpose of the site survey is to make sure you don't have any nulls or dead spots. And like I said, in this case, the uh, radio station couldn't cover Knoxville. So you can have dead spots without tuning the antenna for the environment. So just kind of keep in mind that. But the, the real takeaway here is this monopole is designed for APs with a ground plane or a surface. So if you take a look at the 3500 uh, here on the left, you can use monopoles on that because we've got all that metal ground there. But you don't want to use a monopole on the end of an AP1240 because there's no ground. That's just a the side of the AP and it's very, very thin and there's nothing for it to play ground off of. So if you use the monopole antennas, little stubby antennas, on a 1240, it's not going to radiate well. You're not going to have that nice beach ball effect. It's going to work, but it's not going to work great and you'll take some performance hits. So kind of stay away from that kind of an of a environment. So when we look at a Yagi antenna, which is also a form of a directional antenna, if you take a look at this element way at the back of it, the second to the last element, that's actually a PC board, and that's your dipole, believe it or not. It's called a folded dipole. A folded dipole means your element's actually transmitting on the top and going all the way around and back to the ground again. It's actually an electrical short, but not a radio short. So if you put an ohmmeter on a, on a dipole, you'll see it'll, it'll conduct, and you'll think, oh, this is bad cable or this is bad antenna. It's not. It's an RF. You know, it's not a short for RF. So the, the energy starts out on that dipole around that antenna. The back element's a reflector. That keeps the radio wave from wanting to go backwards. And all the other elements in front of it concentrate that energy to go forward. So that's kind of how a 13.5 dBi Yagi works, you know, our, our area 1949. And I just kind of cut it off, but there's multiple elements in the front there. And but the more elements you put in the front, the more you take that gain and you start going from maybe a, a maybe you have a 30 degree, you know, 30 to 40 degree antenna. If you have a 10 dBi Yagi and start going to 13.5 dBi, starts tuning that down to 25 degrees or less. So the more elements, the more narrow it is. When we look at antennas, they're identified by color. Okay, so all of the 2.4 gig antennas have no identification labels. They're just black because they were the very first antennas that we ever made. The 5 gig antennas, we started putting a blue dot on the antenna. If you look at the one at the bottom there, and we put a blue shrink wrap tubing to show that it is a 5 gig antenna as well. 
We are also, with the introduction of the AP3600, the brand new AP, we now have an orange stripe. Orange indicates that the antenna is both 2.4 gig and 5 gig. So there's actually both of the antennas that you see on the, on the left, the 5 gig and 2.4, are built into this one antenna. And then we filter it out inside the AP. But uh, the takeaway is the 3600 only has four antenna ports, and they're dual band. They're not single band. So if you have a 3600, you cannot use these single band antennas on the right unless you are going to turn off the other radio and not use it. So from a TAC perspective, if you're talking to somebody and they're complaining about RF performance and the range isn't very good and they've got a 3600 AP, you know, verify you got an orange stripe on that thing, that you have a real dual band antenna and that they don't have maybe 5 gig antennas screwed onto it and they're trying to do 2.4 gig or something. You know, wrong antenna will really cut down on your, on your performance. A patch antenna, remember I said before, it's like a light bulb, put a piece of tin foil behind it and you're going forward. That's actually what this is doing. And you can do it with one of the little copper squares, and that would be a low gain antenna, or you can put four copper squares, and these copper squares are actually cut to the right frequency of the radio wave at five gigs. So, so when you use this antenna, you basically get 9.5 dBi of gain. You get you know pretty high gain, and you go forward. And uh, this um, this material you see in the picture behind the antenna is actually an absorbent. We have these ca these rooms called anechoic chambers, and they're they're anechoic means without echo. And when we when we model an antenna we put it in such a room, and then we can draw our patterns and things, and we'll touch on that in a little bit. But, but the, the, the takeaway is, is antennas have gain. You get nothing for free. The higher the gain, the more you're taking it from somewhere else, right? So a low gain, like 2.2 dBi Omni, radiates everywhere uniform like a beach ball. Higher gain, like 5 dBi Omnis, 8 dBi, 10 dBi Omnis. It's like taking the beach ball and pushing the top and the bottom. You go out farther, but not so much up and not so much down. So uh, you could actually put a, a dipole on top of the roof of a, of a four-story building, go out in the parking lot and hit that AP just fine, put a 12 dBi Omni up there, and it's shooting out like a pancake, and you won't even get into it with a, a laptop at the base, and you can physically see it. So, you know, the, the idea here is that antennas can be modeled different ways by a gain and how, how they're designed. This is just a breakdown of all the single band 2.4 gig antennas. Cisco's got so many antennas because we've got APs that use single antennas. We've got APs that use three in one antennas and now four in one antennas. But anyway, just this is kind of a breakdown of the basic antennas and the basic gains that we offer. You know, the dipole is the lowest gain antenna. The ceiling mount's a low gain because you want that to radiate everywhere. 6 dBi is a wall mount, so you put that on a patch and you cover down a hallway. The uh, 5.2 dBi ceiling mount is, is used in a lot of manufacturing areas where you want nice coverage and some gain, right? And, and you, but you don't want so much, you know, gain that, that you've got a lot of dead spots when you're shooting above the, the, the users. And this is just to complement the same thing for 5 gig. So here's, you see a lot of these antenna patterns and I kind of wanted to explain a little bit of how that, that works. So there's two types of patterns. When you, when you look at an antenna pattern, all you're saying is, is, is I'd like to know how that, that antenna radiates. A dipole being low gain radiates, like I said, like a beach ball in a 360 degree in a very uniform pattern. And that's the azimuth plane. That's the plane where the antenna is up in the air vertical and you're vertical next to the antenna and you walk around the antenna you can see that you have a really uniform coverage on a low-gain dipole antenna. But if you look at the elevation plane, you'll see these two uh, kind of circles, but a but kind of dead spot right up and right below. What happens there is the radio wave is leaving the antenna, but it's not end-firing out the tip. You know, if you look at this dipole on the right with a little element sticking out, we're not end-firing from the top, and we're not radiating below us. So that's why you see these dimples or these dead spots in elevation. Uh, the important thing to know there is, is that if you're right underneath something, it's not as good as if you're a little bit farther away on the elevation side of things. If you're going to mount antennas outdoors, it's always best if, you, if you're if you doing a mesh deployment or you're doing something and you're mounting antennas outside, 
if you can put the antennas on the same mass pipe or the same tower and you put them above each other, you actually get some isolation because you can see this null in the elevation pattern, right? So if you can put the antennas on the same pole and get, you know, four or five feet separation or more between them, that's a lot better than having, say, two Yaggies on, the, on different frequencies or the same frequencies next to each other side by side because when they're side by side, they swamp each other. They, it's like turning on a bright light, you know, so when you're... I used to be a police officer years ago. When you look at a police car real far away, you know, you don't see the blue lights until you get close. You know, the red washes it out, right? And you can have the same thing with radio waves. If you've got two transmitters on the air, even if they're on different frequencies, if they're close enough, they can cause each other problems. So if you're doing an outdoor deployment, put them on the same pole or get some height separation, and that's always better. If you take a look at other antennas, when you put an antenna in the field of another antenna or another piece of metal, if I put a dipole, which has a really uniform pattern, and the, this antenna below here is actually a monopole. We're using the metal of the, ape, of the antenna base, the ground, and each one of these is a monopole. And one in its own, if you just have one of them there and no other elements, you'd have almost a perfect circle. But because there's another element in the near field, another one in the near field, there's three of them in one package, Look at the pattern. It's still a really nice pattern in red. That's your azimuth going around the antenna. And your null is, of course, the metal behind the antenna and the end firing out the end, right? But, but that's how you read them. So if you look, the end antenna and look at the middle antenna, there's ever so slight differences between them. So you know, we, we usually model every element on our antennas, and then typically we'll show you the middle one or, or the end one unless you get the data sheet for the antenna. But... Uh, you know, keep in mind that when you put an antenna near a piece of metal, any kind of metal, even if it's another antenna on the same frequency, you're going to change the properties a little bit. And I just kind of wanted to show you how that's shown out in the, in the antenna radiation pattern. Here's a patch antenna. This is a low-gain antenna. Remember I said it was a lot like taking a piece of tin foil, putting it behind the light bulb and going forward? Same deal. If you look at the asthma, and that's the, the around the antenna, you know, you've got most of your signal going out the direction that the patch is, is pointing. So if you mount that antenna on the wall, it's going to go forward, and its forward azimuth plane will look like this. And, of course, the elevation up and down, you know, you get a lot of wavy spots because, you know, it's designed to go forward, not cover the, the room above or the, or the floor below. So anyway, that's the pattern of a, of a low-gain one-element patch. If you... Now, if you look at this pattern here on the left, and I'm going to switch to a high-gain antenna, look what happens there. A high-gain antenna will have multiple elements, and it will send out almost all of the signal in a smaller pattern, right? So 30-30 so on each side, so bring that down, and we've got a small, narrow area that we're sending out the signal. And then there's these little nulls on the sides, these deep nulls, and coverage on each side. That's, that's what happens as you get multiple elements together. We focus it in a given direction. Then you have a little bit of a null, and you have some side lobes, as they're called. And that, this is just the pattern for, for that antenna. So you can see all you're doing is you're taking multiple elements, and you're just trying to focus that energy better in a given direction. So if you look at an outdoor antenna, like uh, th this sector antenna here, what we wanted was we wanted this sector antenna to be able to radiate forward really and in in, in forward in a nice uniform way, and, and, and you can see that in this pattern here. This is a 14 dBi sector antenna, and we've actually scaled it back a little bit. It would have been a higher gain, like 17 dBi or so, but we did things with the elements in the package so that our overall gain is nice and uniform and going forward. Now, this elevation pattern, you're looking at that going, well, why do I care about the elevation pattern on that antenna? Well, if you mount that antenna on a tower, now I care about that. Well, why, I, didn't, I didn't need to care about elevation indoors so much. But if I take this elevation and I turn the pattern so it looks like it would look from the tower, now look what you've got. Your elevation pattern has nulls you can see the nulls in the pattern. So when you look at this pattern here and you see all these squiggly lines, looking at it here, you can see the areas where you have low signal. We've done everything we could to scale it back and build this null. This, If you look at the second null here and the way that that's, that's built out, we 
did everything to, li to really reduce those nulls. So this is a very good designed antenna so that most of its fill is out there so that even if the antenna is way above, you know, over the, over the user's head, there's a big elevation differential, we can still cover this antenna real well. Other antennas, you know, like, like a really high-gain Omni, might l leave this tower like a pancake and not have any down tilt or any down fill. And in that case, the only time the antenna would work is when it's talking to another antenna at roughly the same height or so many miles out that the radio wave gets, you know, bigger and bigger and starts covering that area. So now we understand a little bit about how antennas radiate, how they work. Now I want to talk a little bit about indoors and, and some of the, the things with 802.11n. So looking at .11n, or any radio wave for that matter, when radio waves bounce, okay, remember I told you that radio goes, is AC and it goes back and forth, back and forth, and creates these sine waves or this nice pattern where the signal went one direction, went down to another direction, came back up again, and it's nice and clean. Unfortunately, when an antenna bounces, okay, you know, if, if, the, if the two signals arrive in phase, it's called constructive interference and the signal's actually stronger. If they arrive out of phase, they can cancel each other out or step on each other where you've got part of a, a pattern and another pattern and they sort of get distorted. If we take a look at how that works here, you know, in, in this case with, an, with a 1240 AP, the uh, 1240 comes up and uses the right antenna. So it comes up using the primary right antenna, sends a signal to this user over here, and the same signal might bounce off the ceiling, a filing cabinet, whatever, and depending upon how it got there, it could have either been a really stronger signal, you know, like, like what we have here, or it could have been a diminished signal. So looking at it from that perspective, when you, you, know, when you look at, at how these signals combine, .11n uses something called OFDM, which is a method of sending symbols over the air, and it, it can better put some of this together and, um, and can help overcome some of the multipath uh, you know, that occurs. But, but keep in mind how it reflects is, is a little bit on how well that works. So if you, if you mount the antenna near a metal object like, like this one here, you know, you're creating all of that multipath and all of that reflection stuff right at the antenna, and you don't want to do that. A lot of folks have a temptation to mount the antennas right up against a metal I-beam or, or in places where you don't want it to. So you really want to understand that that antenna is collecting that radio wave, and you don't want any sort of reflections that are unintentional. So as I mentioned before, you know, how, how the 1240 works, you know, we just use one antenna. But we use, we use one antenna, and when we have retries or reflections occur, we sample the other, the left antenna, and if it works, we just start using that one. With dot 11n, it's a little bit more complex. With dot 11n, we are, have three receivers now instead of one. You know, the 1240 used one receiver, shared two antennas, and like the old police scanner, would go back and forth and pick the antenna with the best performance. In MIMO, you know, it, you know with multiple input, multiple output, we use something called maximum ratio combining, and it's the ability for the receiver to hear on all three antennas. So each antenna has its own receiver, and now when that signal is sent out, all the receivers hear it at the same time, put all the symbols back together again, and you have a much better method of diversity. But the, you know, so, so having multiple receivers really helps a lot of times we'll find a customer will take one of these APs and they'll say, I'll just put one 2.4 gig antenna on it and one 5 gig antenna on it. Well, you're robbing yourself of those extra receivers and the ability to decode those signals. And in the case of dot 11 n you, you, you rob yourself of throughput. But, but more importantly, you, know, you, you have something that has multiple transmitters and receivers. You want to have as many antennas as you have ports on the device. Now, we talked a little bit about this interference and how things reflect, and I kind of wanted to touch on that again. It's, it's kind of dwelling on it a bit much, but I, I wanted to explain that when you have a signal that bounces and it arrives in different places, like, like in the example at the bottom here, you can have that constructive interference where they add to each other and they have a good signal, 
or they take away from each other by canceling each other out. A, um, the way beam forming works, on, and, and we have two types of beam forming. We have client link 1.0, which is used on the 3500, and client link 2.0, which is used on the 3600. Client link 1.0 works like this. You have two transmitters at the top there, and we can hear the client sending the signal back to the AP, and we know how that reflection is happening because we have three radio receivers that can hear that client coming back. So what we do then is we alter the timing of our transmitter signal so that we create basically a reflection happening because the timing of the transmitters went on. You know, as one transmitter started just a little bit below before, a little bit after the other one. And by doing that, you can direct the signal. If you look at the, the picture down here at the bottom, you know, if, if you were sending out of two antennas and you were in the middle, the middle might not be the ideal location. If you could delay a transmitter just a little bit, you can actually form beam form or beam steer that signal to the client. And all you're doing is you're making, if you look at this constructive interface, you're making what is a typical radio wave look like a much stronger them. Thank you. So you can see that, that by, by doing that, you can feed a signal to the client much stronger, and that allows the client to better decode it. So here's just some uh, terminology for, for 802.11n. Transmit beam forming is one of the things that I just talked about, how we can delay that signal to do that. Maximum ratio combining, we'll touch on what that is, and, and we'll touch on channel bonding and spatial multiplexing. But I just wanted to give you a, a definition point here to, to go here and, and to let you know that the .11n access points in the 3500 series use two transmitters and three receivers per radio module. So, you know, a, a typical 30, 3500 AP you know, has six antennas, so that each one has two transceivers per band and one extra receiver. The 3600 has four antennas, and all four are transceivers. They transmit and receive. So if we take a look at the elements of dot 11N, you have this beam forming that I talked about. By delaying when you send your transmitter out, you can steer it to the client making a stronger signal to the client. That's called beam forming. There's maximum ratio combining. What maximum ratio combining does is it allows you to send the same signal out on multiple antennas. If you can, if you can send the same signal out on two antennas at the same time, that's not beam forming. That's just getting more redundant signal out there for a more reliable connection. You're able to make that client hear better. So by sending redundant signals, by timing them, changing the timing, beam forming it to the client, you know, you, what you're doing is you're taking a client that would otherwise have trouble with reflections and retries and just catering it so that, the, you know, so that that signal goes right to that customer or that client and making it easier to decode. So anyway, you've got with, with spatial multiplexing, that's the other portion of it, is you can send the signal out on multiple streams. So you can have two signals with different information going out at the same time. And that allows for a faster throughput. That's how we get speeds up to 300 meg or so. And the way that you get fast speeds is you send out different information on all the antennas, and you can bond channels or use a larger channel. So one channel is usually 20 megahertz wide. So think of it like a two-lane road, right? If you take two channels and marry them together, you can get much faster throughput. So your two 20 meg channels become one 40 meg channel, and the, the space that we had between the two channels that we use for isolation, we can take advantage of that and use that for extra throughput as well. So the, the takeaway here is is dot 11 n brings you, you know, this this packet aggregation that we're going to talk about. It brings it brings up a wider channel. It sends different data out, different antennas. There's many, many things that happen in 802.11n that get you this really high speed, right? So, so without packet aggregation, you know, you're sending a packet at a time, and, and with .11n, we just kind of can kill some of that overhead, you know, round the packets up together and send them out, out faster. So the, the real takeaway here is that 802.11n is not frequency specific. In other words, if I'm dot 11N, it doesn't mean I'm on 2.4, it doesn't mean I'm on 5 gig. It can be in either band. 
So, you know, the earlier when you had the 802.11a, that was 5 gig only. B was 2.4 gig only. G was 2.4 gig only. N can be in either band. And when you bond these channels together, uh, we don't do channel bonding typically in 2.4 gig because when you do that and you and you bond this channel, you know, normally you only have 1, 6, and 11 that don't overlap. So when you bond it, you're gobbling up 1 and 6. or You, know, you, you take away all of the channel spacing model that you have to be able to, to, to send out AP. So when you when you scatter APs out at 2.4 gig, you, know, you use 1, 6, and 11, then once reuse 1, 6, and 11. If you bond a channel, that's okay for home use, you know, but you're really eating up that spectrum. And 5 gig is really where you want to do that with. So the, the, the takeaway is, is when you have a bonded channel, if you look at this chart below, you have an extension channel and a primary channel, right, or the data channel. You know, you have a control channel and an extension channel. What happens there is, is, is that way, even though you bond a channel, if a client cannot do bonded, then it can still work on, on one of the channels. It, it, you know, we're, you're still running two 20 meg channels together so that it can decode that if it needs to. But when you're looking at channel reuse and bonding channels, you really want to do that at, at 5 gig because at 2.4 here, you really don't have any place that you can bond. I mean, you can, you can only bond two channels together anywhere in the given band, and, and that's it. In 5 gig, you've got a lot more channels to play with. You've got the whole uni, you know, uni 1, uni 2, uni 2 extended, uni 3. So, so the takeaway is there's a lot more channels at 5 gig, so we support channel bonding at 5 gig. We don't support it in 2.4. When you bond the channel together, you know, you're basically, in that other chart I showed you, you're, you're able to put this together and get more bandwidth, you know, because of the way that we break up the subcarriers. There's, there's extra space in there that, that you get. And also, there's something called a guard interval. And guard interval is, high, you know, is, is, is that little space that we use to keep track of inter symbol interference. We're sending out all of these signals and, and symbols out there. You know, the spacing between the symbols is this guard interval, right? So the faster the you know, the faster the guard interval is, you know, or, or, you know, shorter it is, the more data you can get in. So, we'll take, so the guard interval generally is, is 400 to 800 nanoseconds. And 800 is the default on the 3500, but we use the shorter guard interval where we can. So here's just a chart of, of how that would apply to the 3500. So if you have 3500 AP and you ran you know, these spatial streams, that means whether you have one transmitter sending the same information or two transmitters sending different information. If you have two transmitters sending different information, you've got two spatial streams. So with both of them transmitting, if you go all the way down here to MCS index 15, both streams are on the air, go all the way to the right, and we've got a short guard interval, 400 nanoseconds, we've got a bonded channel. So if you have a, two channels that are married together, and you're sending two spatial streams, and you have a guard interval that's short, you can get 300 meg. And that's kind of how we, how we arrive at the fact that the 3500 can do 300 meg, and the new 3600 can do 450 meg. And I'll show you the new MCS rates for that in a little bit. I've got a chart for that as well. So the, the takeaway here is when everything is working together, right, when you don't have MRC, you know, maximum ratio combining, you don't have transfer beam forming, no spatial multiplexing, you're running around at 24 meg. As you start to add things, you, and, and all of these things are enabled, spatial multiplexing, transmit beam forming, MRC, that's how you get your 300 meg. Everything is firing on all, on all cylinders. I want to talk now a little bit about the different APs out there and that we're offering today and kind of tell you a little bit about those as well. So this is the new product lineup. Starts out with the AP 600. 600 is our home teleworker. That's the small AP that that you basically take home with you and replicate your office at home. 1040 AP is is very similar to the 3500. Only you'll see the two dimples in there because we've gotten rid of the two extra receivers. So it's priced a little bit lower price point for entry level businesses. Then we've got the 3500, 1260, 1140 for rich media and then the new 3600 for mission critical. So if we look at how that breaks down, 
the new 3600 could do 450 meg, 3500 could do 300 meg, right? So we've got more radios in the 3600. We now support a better beam forming in the 3600. The uh, it's just a it's a newer AP, but but this just gives you a breakdown of all the different APs and what supports what. You know, folks want to know what what works with Office Extend, what works with Mesh. So it's just kind of a breakdown of all the different ones that are out there. I showed you a chart a little bit ago that showed all the spatial streams just above this yellow, which told me if you if you look at the last white one all the way at the bottom right, 300 meg. With the new 3600, we're bringing in new additional modulation coding schemes. We now have MCS rates 16 through 23. Go over and you can see that what that throughput is. If you go all the way to the right, you'll see it's 45 meg, 90, 135, 180. So why do I want those when I've got them different places? Well, this gives you more data rates that the client can choose from to keep a faster data rate. And using three spatial streams or three transmitters that can send different information out all at the same time, we're now able to get 450 meg, assuming we have a bonded channel and a short guard rate. But it's just this is kind of a nice chart to keep. A lot of guys in the office here in Richfield have this thing printed out sitting on their wall because they just want to know if you're at MCS rate 13 or 18, you know, how fast is that? You know, and it's kind of a nice breakdown. We used to give you the data rates and the old dial 11B and G rates and A rates. We would tell you you're connected at 54 meg or 24 meg, but it just wasn't practical anymore. There was just so many different rates that now it's just an MCS number, modulation coding scheme number. You have to kind of use this decoder chart here to see what the throughput really is. So what do I want to install, an internal or an external unit? Well, integrated antennas or internal antenna units are more aesthetically pleasing. They're nicer for carpeted areas because they don't have antennas hanging down or dangling down. But the external antenna models are really good for hospital environments, manufacturing environments, places where you have a lot of temperature range differences and places where you want to use directional antennas to focus the energy in a given direction. So if we take a look at this carpeted AP, the one on the left here, when you put that on a ceiling, you can mount this thing on a ceiling rail, like what's up here on the, on the right, or you can mount it actually in the tile. But either way, it radiates like it does here in this, in this picture. It radiates downward in a 360-degree pattern. So these antennas are really designed to mount on a ceiling and radiate downward. The external antennas, you can get the same feel of that if you use a ceiling antenna. And if you have a locking box, say like this this one at the bottom right, is an Oberon locking bracket, or uh, you know, you know, some people like to secure or physically lock the AP into the ceiling, and then use the ceiling antennas below. So the external antennas work good for that, or in areas where you are going to wash down the AP with you know alcohol in a hospital environment, or if you have a need for it to run at a higher or lower temperature. The external units can usually run neg 20 to 55C. So that's the, the big advantage. Also, if you're going to use bridging, if you have the iOS, the uh, autonomous iOS versions, and you want to use a workgroup bridge or an outdoor bridge, you need something with antenna connectors to get that antenna outside. Uh, this is just a slide when to use a 1240 and 1250. The 1240 and 1250 and, uh, APs can use a little higher gain antennas. We're limited to 6 dBi antennas on the, on the 3500 and 3600 APs. If you've got an outdoor application and you want to use a 10 dBi antenna, the older APs can run the higher gain antennas. Uh, the, the takeaway there is we, we supported higher gain antennas on the older products, but we limited the antenna gain of 6 dBi on newer products because 6 dBi is a good good thing to be able to, to get most patch antennas in and also at the same time allow us to do this and maintain PoE 802.3 AF compliance. When you start using higher gain antennas, you've got to run a higher transmitter. You've got to run a higher voltage on your power amplifier on the transmitter side, and that causes you to have PoE draw concerns. So that's why we have a limit of 6 dBi on the newer products. So which one's right? Well, it uh, depends on what you're going to do, right? I mean, mo most folks have, uh, any any more want clean air and spectrum intelligence, so that's really the 3500, 3600 APs. 
But if you don't need clean air and you just want a lower cost, you know, AP, you can use the 1140s. You can use the, you know, the even the older 1250s. The 1250, uh, it's either EOL or is going that way pretty soon. So um, it's just kind of a hang. This is a, a hangover from an earlier slide I had used. But I wanted to show you the coverage differences. They're very similar. The you know, 1140, 1250, 3500. If, if you do a site survey with an 1140, you can certainly drop a 3500i in its place. If you did a survey with a 1250, you could put a 3500e in its place. You know, it's just, there's, they're very, very similar in the coverage patterns. Well, we, we've done a lot of effort to try to make sure that when we put these APs in place, that you don't have to resurvey if you do something. In other words, all of our changes that we're doing in APs are done so that the client gets less retries. We're doing things to make sure that we can beam form, beam steer, you know, client link 2.0 signals to the client so that they can easier, easily, more easily decode them, but not for the purpose of getting greater range. You know, a lot of people think, well, you know, client link only helps on the edge, and it, it doesn't. Client link or beam forming helps whether you're on the edge or you're very close to the network. But the, the takeaway is we designed it so that the cell sizes stay the same. So whether you got beamforming on or not, whether you're running an 1140 or a 3500, you know, a survey is a survey for the most part. You know, unless you're doing something with external antennas, you know, you can expect coverage to be pretty uniform between the different APs. When you install APs in a, in a given area, one of the things that you want to try to do is space them apart so that they don't hear each other. Uh, it's okay if they hear each other, but, but you get more performance the, bit, the more isolation that you have. So in the case of 2.4 gig, you have, only have channels 1, 6, and 11. So you, you start your cells out like 1, 6, and 11 and try to build it out so that you, know, you, can, you can keep different channels. You know, you, you know, if, you've got, if you've got an area that you're trying to cover, you don't want to put them all on channel 1 because if, if there's a lot of traffic on channel 1, and the, then the other cells are in contention with that, right? So you, you just have to kind of give a little thought on how you lay out your channels. And in the case of 5 gig, you've got so many channels that don't overlap that you can put them just about uh, about anywhere. You can spread out your channel model like this. But but the the, the real the only difference between 2.4 and 5 gig is that 2.4 is a bigger radio wave. You know, 5 gig is a smaller radio wave, so it's a little harder to push that 5 gig wave out farther. And you have weather radar concerns, right? So, so five gig has weather radar. So there's Uni one, which is indoors, Uni two, Uni two extension, Uni three, and uh, I don't know if this is going to be a build-out slide or not. But uh, anyway, the, the, the takeaway here is, is is that when you have radar, these APs will detect weather radar if it can hear it. If it can, it'll start shutting those channels down and force the AP to use other channels. So it dynamically changes your channel model based upon whether radar is present or not. So uh, this is a, an older slide as well, but it just kind of shows you how much throughput and how many channels that are available theoretically in, in the U.S. and Europe. Just you know, the, the takeaway here is that, there, is that five gig is not necessarily fixed. Five gig has has to allow the unit to, to change in the presence of weather radar. When you're mounting an access point, you want to mount the access point if it's an internal antenna model like the 1140 or the 3500, 3600i. You want to mount that on the ceiling because remember we saw a picture before where it radiates downward and outward in a 360 degree pattern. If you mount it on a wall, it's going to want to shoot up and shoot down. And that's okay if you have a small hotspot, a kiosk, you know, something that you're just trying to enable, you know, a, a transportation bus, for example. But if you mount this AP in an enterprise dense environment and you wall mount it, it's going to have a metal plate behind the AP, so it's not going to go very well behind the wall. And because it's designed to radiate downward and outward in a 360, it's going to radiate outward and upward and downward. So if you put 1140 on a wall, you could actually cover the floor above the floor below, which you don't want because if you have a client like a, a phone and the guys walk, guy or girl's walking down the hall talking on the phone, you don't want the AP to vote. You don't want the client to vote to the AP on a floor above or below it, just to lose coverage immediately as they walk away. Right. So, so if you're going to wall mount something, wall mount the external units and use the dipoles. 
So you could use this dipole this way, where you put the two on top. The two tra in the 3500, the two end antennas, the ones that are straight vertical and straight down, you know, straight up, straight down, those are transmitters. The one in the middle on the 3500 is receive only. So it doesn't matter, it's an orientation. So it can be horizontal like that because you're keeping your transmit signal, you know, to vertical polarity. Another way to do that, if you think that, that looks a little odd with the star formation like that, you can, if you use a 3600, they only have four antennas, they can all go up or down. Or ideally, if you have to wall mount, use a, a mounting bracket that lets, it, lets you do that. So the Oberon uh, wall mount unit has a, a kind of a wedge thing that you can take the cover off, you can mount the AP under it, get to all the cabling and mount it on a wall. And then if you mount this on the wall up high, it's mounted exactly like it would be if it was on the ceiling, and that's really the ideal place. And, and the 3600 in this picture here has a dual band antenna, and notice how, how the antennas come way down below the AP. The, nothing performs better, as I said before, than a dipole that's away from the electronics and down there hanging down. Th this AP mounted on a ceiling with the dipoles, you know, will outperform you know, just about anything because the antennas are down lower, away from things, but, but aesthetically, it doesn't look nearly as nice as the internal units. When you look at the antenna on an internal unit, this is very similar to the monopoles we talked about that require the ground plane. So the antenna, this is an inverted F antenna. This antenna is mounted on this metal plate that's on the AP. Now the, the AP has a, a radome or plastic cover that hides this, but I wanted you to see that the antennas on the 2.4 gig side are physically bigger than those on the 5 gig. You know, higher the frequency, smaller the radio wave. But this antenna here works very well because it radiates downward, outward, like a three, in a 360-degree pattern, and it works very, very well. This antenna would do better, but aesthetically, which one would you have? You know, you'd, you'd want the internal one, but you see nothing draping down, right? And you can see these patterns. If you take a look at the pattern on the internal AP here, it's almost a circle, but that dipole, if you remember, snapped into a perfect circle. So, you know, it's just a little bit different, and you can see the null, you know, if you look at the bottom right here, you can see that null where the metal plate of the AP is. You know, remember the antenna's mounted over here, and there's a metal plate behind it, so it's not going to radiate behind it, that metal plate. And you can see that null right there at the bottom right, that big sharp, you know, dip in there. So that's what you have, uh, when, you know, when, when you have this type of ceiling mount. And that's how to interpret it on, on different antennas. So the takeaway is nothing looks nicer than, an, than a unit without any antennas sticking down, if you can, especially if you can mount it flush in the tile. And um, if you need to lock it in a metal box, there's Oberon solutions, tearaway solutions that allow you to do that. You can also change the color of the AP. If you don't like the color, you know, the white color, Oberon has these plastic skins that can go over the AP, and it will change the color of the access point. Some people who don't want to look at the LED can hide it that way by putting a piece of tape under behind that thing and block the light. So, you know, there's many different options that you have. This is just kind of a, a, a drawing to show you how that it clips to the rail. So we've got these clips that allow you to put the AP. If the AP can't fit on the ceiling rail because the rail is recessed or drops down, you know, we've got adapter clips that let you do that. So. Just be aware that those clips exist, and you know, just just this is kind of just a, a view of how it would look if it was mounted on the ceiling from the backside. Some people like to put the access points in areas above the ceiling. They they think, well, you know, if I could put the AP out of sight, out of mind, if I just put it up there and just drop it behind the tile, you know, I I personally prefer if people could do it that they use that mount that I was showing here that goes right in the tile, because then now it's flush with the tile. But if you choose not to do that, then if you go above the ceiling, you've got to stay away from all this metal. There's a lot of metal objects and things that are in the, in the plenum area or the above ceiling tile area. And looking at that, we've got a mount, mounting kit for almost all the APs. You can buy things from Erico and other people that, like this optional T-bar that lets you mount to the rails and suspend the AP just under the, the ceiling tile. So you could put the AP, since the AP is plenum rated or antennas are plenum rated, you can put the access point above the tile, 
straddle the two rails and put the ceiling tile in its place and not know it's even there. And that's okay if there's nothing up in the, in the ceiling. Like, you know, you're looking for areas like this. What happens is we find people who mount these things. Remember, the if you think of the antenna like a light bulb, you don't want to put an obstruction in, in the front of a light bulb, especially if you're trying to read a book, right, or you're trying to use that light. And it's the same with RF. You don't want obstructions there. So we, we found customers, and, and from a TAC perspective, you've probably seen this a lot more than we have even, you know, you get a customer that's complaining about poor performance or coverage that isn't working well. You know, if you can, make them send you a picture where they mounted the AP because, you know, when you get pictures like this, uh, you know, you can you can see the problem without any – not even, you know, there's no point in looking at heat patterns and radiation patterns and, and, and antenna coverage things when they're doing dumb things. I mean, if, when you look at this, this is a dipole antenna. It's designed to hang down and radiate in a 360 degree pattern. When you put it right in a metal box and put metal right next to the dipole, it cannot radiate well. And then add to that some more metal, you know, pipes, you know, gas pipes or water pipes, whatever that is. And now all of a sudden this thing is very directional. It, it, you've got acute multipath problems, you know, signals are being distorted. Even if the AP supports client link and beam forming and everything else, you can't do that because if you start out bad, it's it's just going to stay bad. And, you know, people do things. Um, this is another picture of an AP that's above the ceiling with all of these metal pipes and things right in front of it. And, again, if you wouldn't put a light bulb up there, don't put an AP there. The best location for an access point is as close to the users as possible. You know, I mean, you, you really don't want that radio signal to have to travel any farther than it needs to, and you don't want it encumbered with junk and things. You know, I hate to know how much it costs somebody to pay to have somebody put that in there just to, after they do it to, to have to rip it all out because it's certainly not going to work very well at all. And, and we see things, you know, when I, when I mentioned that the antennas need to go on the ceiling so they radiate downward, you know, people do this. You know, they'll put an AP that's, that's designed for a ceiling and radiate down and outward and put it put it on a wall where, as I told you before, it end fires up and down, which is not what you want, and they'll put a pipe in front of it. And, and you know, these are real deployments that people have done. You know, or they'll put them in a NEMA box, a, a metal, you know, uh, an outdoor enclosure, but they won't watertight anything or seal anything. You know, this is a 1200 AP just sitting in a in an ice in a pile of ice. You know. And, People do this, and, and, and you know, the, the, the sad part about it is the AP is built so well that, you know, it'll run for a long time in, in, in bad environments like that, and then it'll fail. So you might get a call going, well, it ran for a month and a half, and, you know, I don't know why it's dead now, you know. And, and it's, you can see, you can always tell so much by just capturing a picture, you know. Uh, pictures tell you everything. I mean, if if, if you mount the, an, uh, an outdoor patch antenna right up against a metal chain link fence, it's going to be nothing but multipath and trouble all the way down. If you mount a dipole antenna, which is designed to be in free space, away from all metal objects, right in a metal box with the dipole right against the metal, it's certainly not going to work. It's certainly going to have a lot of problems, and you're going to kind of wish you hadn't done that, right? So uh, I just like to kind of talk about the things that go wrong just so that you get an idea. And sometimes they're actually funny. You know, there's a there was a barn in the U.K. or whatever, and... Uh, you know, bird made a nest right over the AP, and, you know, the AP is still running great. But, you know, if you remember the 1130, it actually ran a lot warmer than a lot of our other APs because the 11, the 1130, with this mood ring LED kind of thing that we had on it, that AP was our first internal antenna designed ceiling mount antenna, and we were mostly plastic, so we had to get rid of a lot of heat. So we got a lot of heat dissipating out of the metal plate in the back of it, right? And I imagine that uh, I made a nice home. But anyway, things like that, you know, you, you want pictures of, of things that fail, you know, when, when you're having trouble. Even in manufacturing environments, people will put the AP with a, like up here with a dipole straight up right behind an I-beam, you know. That, that's immediately going to take that antenna that was supposed to radiate in a 360-degree pattern and mold it and start sending it one direction, which is what you don't want, you know. So it, it's, it's that kind of thing that, that you really want to want to try to avoid. And uh, if you can do that, if you can just kind of, when you're looking at, at things, look at it from a common sense thing. In other words, don't put a really high-gain antenna indoors. Don't put an antenna 
next to metal. You know, just be aware that almost all of these problems with RF is just common sense things that people just don't pick up on because they don't think of the radio as, as being something that, that needs to be out there like a light bulb and, and away from things, right? So, so that's kind of, um, in a nutshell, what you have to know about RF and technology and, and things that are there. I, I, um, I will tell you that I just did a, an SCVT training, and um, there's some other training out there on the 3600. I'd, I'd encourage you to take a look at some of that training as well. I've, I've, in, in that one, I, I do a little bit more uh, deep dive into what client link is. And in fact, there's going to be a Tech TV episode uh, coming out soon, Cisco Tech TV, that explains how three spatial streams and beam forming and all of that works. So I really encourage you to take a look at that. And with that, I'm going to sh uh, shut this thing down and we'll uh, try to take some questions and, and see if I can get this uh, stop sharing and we'll get the recorder off and we'll take questions.